So just quick introduction to Dave. I don't know. It's like pretty much every, what can I say about Dave Patterson? D Dave Patterson, that it's, I, I think I'll just, okay, I'll just say he has been a professor at Berkeley, started in 1976, done a lot of great work, and has won the Turing Award. I'll just stop there. <laughs> it's, uh, it's just hard to do justice to his resume. And um, he, uh, he's going to tell us about TPUs and carbon uh, footprint of uh, ML workloads. All right. Uh, this is the abbreviated version of a longer talk. So uh, if you're interested to hear the papers, you can go read uh, about it. Um, but we've been uh, doing TPUs, or we started doing TPUs a decade ago at Google uh, before I got there. So far, we've announced uh, these five different ones. The first one that got us started was for inference, and that's also what we call TPU v4 Lite. And we've done three supercomputers for training that can also do inference. And you can see uh, that they expanded from 256 nodes to 4K nodes and more than an exaflop. So here are the 10 lessons, and I, uh, you'll have to go read the paper to go over all, but I, I'm just gonna go over one of them, which is uh, that it's really easy to increase the flops in hardware. It's really hard to improve the memory bandwidth. Um, so what people are doing now that the end of Denard scaling is the big thing that limits chips designs today, besides the slowing of Moore's law, is how much power you can dissipate. So if energy is the limit, then, gee, what's the relative cost of, of all the energy? And kind of surprisingly, or shockingly, it's going to off-chip DRAM. The main memory accesses are hugely more expensive. You can see it's about a factor of 100 more than on-chip SRAM, and factors of 1,000 versus a, a, an arithmetic unit, uh, an arithmetic operation, like an integer add or multiply, or a narrow one for into this. So what are people doing? They're putting thousands of arithmetic units to kind of balance, amortize the DRAM memory accesses. And so that's how these AI accelerators are over uh, providing compared to standard CPUs. It's got thousands of accelerators because they can afford that energy budget and AI accelerators can use those mul arithmetic multiply units. And so, uh, and it works pretty well, you know, with Moore's law slowing, not everything changes uh, equally well, but logic improves pretty well, so we can put more of these matrix multiply units, more arithmetic units on these chips, which is a reason how we can increase peak performance. Okay, so that's kind of the quick, what's been going on in the hardware. It's, it's really the memory that's the challenge. It's easy to add flops, and you can, the future in architecture is special purpose architectures, because general purpose processors are only kind of barely improving. So I got into this next phase about carbon emissions. I got into it because just reading articles. Uh, I, I joined uh, Google seven years ago, and I, did, I didn't know anything about machine learning when I got there. But a couple of years ago, uh, this came out in IEEE Spectrum uh, that it was going to cost $100 billion to train a model in a couple of years and more carbon emissions in New York. So I asked my ML friends, is this true? Well, they didn't think it was true, but nobody had any data. so. That got us kind of into that. And if you think this claim is startling, that was topped six months later by this white paper that claimed in, in five years from this white paper or four years from this white paper, it was going to cost more than the GDP in the United States. Okay, so that's all right. So then I wanted to find out what was going on here. So what this reminded me of this cartoon uh, from SKCD, and uh, the cartoonist said, you know, to be humorous. Well, let's try and extrapolate on a long curve, on a long curve over time, the word sustainable. So he looked in the past and got the present day and extrapolated in the future. Suppose the trends continue. Well, then the word sustainable would appear once of every page of English text. And then uh, 40 years from now, it would, every sentence would have the word sustainable in it. And 90 years from now, that all of the English text would be the word sustainable just over and over and over again. So, you know, he says the word sustainable is unsustainable, but I think it shows the danger of extrapolating and assuming nothing changes on a log scale. So we tried to figure out what was going on and so had to learn about carbon emissions. And so the energy, which is kind of, that's kind of physics, energy is physics. So it's just hours to train, times the number of processors you use, times the average power per processor, times one more factor. 
This factor is called par uses of effectiveness, which is the industry standard way of talking about the efficiency of energy in the data center. If you think of it, for every watt that goes to a server, there's an extra half watt that gets used up by power distribution or cooling. That's called a PUE of 1.5. So it's kind of the overhead, 1.5. The best you can do is one. Uh, and then we measure the average power. So we get the energy out of that. And then you just multiply it times a factor that's called um, uh, the, the carbon, carbon dioxide equivalent emissions, which includes uh, greenhouse gases. You multiply that factor times the energy and you get your carbon footprint. Uh, Google uh, publishes its percentage of carbon free energy for all of its data centers, which is pretty close to this factor is related to that factor. Okay. Now, what can we do to reduce our carbon footprint? Well, that's, we decided, uh, we looked at what we learned and we put it in a mnemonic, which we call the four M's. So the first one is the model itself, the deep neural network model. So transformer came out in 2017, one of the most important models <laughs> ever invented, I, in my opinion. So colleagues at Google four years later created something called primer, which is just as good a quality as transformer, but it's much more energy efficient and much faster. So switching from transformer to primer four years later made it four times less emissions and four times less energy. So it didn't get worse, it got better. Then the things that I'm more closely with, uh, back in 2017, you might've used a P100 GPU, which really wasn't designed for machine learning. Uh, and then the latest version of the TPU is 14 times more efficient. So multiply those times together. Four years later, we're almost a factor of 60 more energy efficient. Uh, to make a 4M, as we called it mechanization, kind of the, the data center mechanization, that's that PUE factor. And the worldwide average is about 1.7 for PUE at Google data centers. It's about 1.1. So if you run a Google set and, and other people's data centers, not just Google's, uh, the PUE is, you know, much, much better, maybe 1.1. So there's another one four, so we're up to 80. And then the big surprise to me was how much the location, which we call maps in the 4Ms, matters for the, uh, how dirty the energy is. If it's using lots of high percentage of carbon-free energy, then it can be, um, you know, a factor of 10 less. So this case from the average in Google's Oklahoma data center where there's lots of wind energy, it's another factor of nine. So here's a concrete example. Four years later, it was 750 times better if you're careful uh, how you utilize the four Ms, you know, best model, best machine, efficient data centers and good locations. Uh, this paper was done a couple of years ago. So even then there is excitement about what we call large language models today because of uh, what GPT-3 could do. So GLAM is a, you know, I think all ML people wanted to have an answer to GPT-3. So one of Google's answers was called GLAM and it uses mixture of experts. So it has more models, uh, more parameters, a trillion parameters. That's what the big part of GPT-3 was, was a uh, hundred times more parameters. But because it uses mixture of experts, it uh, it only accesses about 8% of the tokens each time, as opposed to 100% of the tokens. So it's a factor of three less time, a factor of three less energy. And because GLAM was trained in Oklahoma compared to the average, that bumps it up to a factor of 14. So putting that in perspective, what what is 550 metric tons of carbon emissions? That's about what 123 cars use in one year. So it drops to 40, which is about nine cars in one year. And, you know, putting in perspective, you know, there's more than a billion cars in the world. Okay. One of the questions I got asked, well, just how much of uh, Google's energy use is for machine learning? So we tried to figure it out. So we looked for the same week in April in 2021, went backwards in time. Uh, it's kind of easy at Google because all the training is done on GPUs and TPUs. So those are separate machines. And then, uh, the, and some, most of the inferences on, well, some inferences on CPUs. So we were able to figure that out. And surprisingly, each of those years, it was between 10 and 15% for machine learning, everything, you know, inference and training. And it was split to be mostly inference, about three fifths for inference and two fifths of training. Now the pie got bigger every year, but the, the slice that was for machine learning stayed 
basically the same. Now, when this got out, there was a meeting like this at Stanford and one of the on ML and one of the Stanford says, well, if it's only 10 or 15 percent of the energy, that's not kind of trivial. I'm going to go work on something else. And so the Stanford people told me of the negative connotations of it. And he wanted to point out, wait, you know, there's that's a lot. It's a lot of the flops, just not a lot of the energy because of that lesson I told you. It's really easy to add flops to it. So we can, you know, by special purpose hardware, you can think of it. It can dominate computation, but we can bring the energy cost through specialization. Now, uh, now let me get into these dire predictions, the Malthusian predictions here. Um, you know, global climate change is important, but we got to get the numbers right to make sure we're working the right thing. So, uh, understandably, uh, even a few years ago, this was an issue of concern. And so, uh, Google pr presented a paper like the same people who made Primer more efficient, they did an earlier effort called the Evolve Transformer, which wasn't as efficient as Primer, but it was more efficient than the original Transformer. But that paper didn't include energy use or emissions. So a group at the University of Massachusetts decide to do the study. Now, what that paper was about, it's called Neural Architecture Search. So this was searching for a better model. And that's not the training of the model, but you're going to search to see if you can find a better model. You use machine learning to improve machine learning. So this paper is very popular. It's uh, up and to the right, you know, thousands of times, a good citation index. So they didn't have access to the 4Ms at Google, so they did it on their own, which is understandable. They used the P100 instead of, at that time, TPU V2. They use averages versus Google data centers one. And so that would account for a factor of five too high. Unfortunately, they didn't understand how the neural architecture search is done. It used to be pretty brute force, but people had figured out how to make it uh, go faster, so it would take them less time. And it also uses less energy. Basically, they use a small proxy rather than the full model for the search. So there's another factor, 19. So their estimate for the NAS was off by a factor of 88 too high. And now the bad news happens. <laughs> that paper is very well cited, but the, it's kind of subtle for some people. Is it the search for a model or the training of the model? So they assumed it was for the training for model. Well, the training is 1,300 times less than the search for it. So there was another factor of 1,300. So these dire predictions are based on a on mistake, right? They're off by 100,000, 120,000 is their estimate. Uh, so, you know, uh, you know, does that mean we have no problems in information technology? Sure we do, that we have our things that we want to do our, our share of. And, but I think it has to do with not the operational energy for training or inference, is, but from the, what's called embodied uh, carbon emissions from manufacturing chips. So embodied is the manufacturing of chips, operational is you bought the chips and you're using them. Um, and so if we just look in 2021, uh, there was 1.3 billion smartphones manufactured, which have lifetimes of two or three years, about a third of a billion PCs and, and 12 million servers, which have longer lifetimes. So I, that's kind of where I think we should be spending our time and where I'm interested in is trying to tackle these problems. I think uh, especially as the grid is being decarbonized over time by you know countries, I think uh, many countries have a goal of 2050 to decarbonize the grid. And, and a bunch of these hyperscalers have goals much shorter than that. You know, Microsoft and Google and Meta, I think are trying to uh, decarbonize by, you know, in the 2030 or so. Okay, with that, I think, uh, let me have one more slide to wrap, wrap up recommendations and open questions. So the four Ms, keep building more efficient models, uh, especially with these large language models uh, and focus on the memory accesses rather than the flops. That'll probably make a real difference. And, you know, publish your results because you know, it'd be great to compete on who's got the most efficient models and to make sure things are accurate so we don't have these mistakes that like we covered. Keep building faster, better hardware. We can get these gains in our efficiency there. One of the challenges is sparsity as well as how can we lower embodied costs, not just the operational costs. Uh, the data centers are already very efficient, but it'd be great to publish, you know, what the carbon, you know, how clean the energy is. And then, you know, uh, practitioners should be picking the clouds at the greenest locations, because that'll reward companies to build in green locations. Uh, 
Google right now has five sites that are about 90% carbon free, but I'm hoping we could use capitalism to encourage people to do the right thing. And I think if we optimize these four M's, we can, you know, realize this potential of ML, you know, to really help in a sustainable manner. Okay. And with that, I should have plenty of time for questions. Let me just thank the people who built the TPUs. Um, is, uh, but I need the first question. If without the first question, there'll be a very short question and answer period. So I'm trying to understand, I think the following maybe um, does, it seems like inference workloads must be on the rise. I kind of wonder like how, how many of these lessons and observations now that it seems like, you know, I go to Google search and now there's stuff running right on top. So the inference workloads must be increasing. Um, these observations, is, is your sense that these observations will hold um, as essentially the workload changes? Well, you know, I, th I think part of my motivation was uh, people were projecting things into the future. So I, I wanted to have an accurate record of what is versus what might be. So uh, that's what we, uh, that's the data we collected. So I think um, it's possible that Google is more training heavy than most companies because, you know, we got a lot of researchers trying to put, push the state of the art. Um, people are very excited about the uh, possibilities of large language models. So we might be higher than other companies, but that's what we are. I think we're thinking about just bringing this out every year. You know, we did this to write a paper and, and you know, we're thinking of we'll do an annual uh, report. And I, I think, in fact, given this audience or given your speakers here, you know, I, I would be interested if other people would join us. Right now, there's a bunch of policy issues, I think because of the misinformation. You know, if, if, if ML training was 100,000 times worse, it'd be a terrible problem, it'd be a giant problem. But because of that misinformation, uh, policymakers think anything that says ML is, is, you know, it's like burning coal or something. So uh, uh, it might be helpful for the people who are working in this area, like Microsoft and Google and Facebook and Amazon, uh, to get together and produce an annual report about what it is. You know, what fraction are we doing? So I would, you know, I uh, mean the dot who's uh, gave a talk here, who's way I'm at the bottom of the totem pole. He's way up at the top of the totem pole. Uh, peop, I saw him asked, what isn't isn't uh, inference going to be a lot bigger. And at least at Google, he thinks training is going to be, uh, for the next few years, is going to be a, um, uh, very significant, I think, because of this excitement about seeing where large language models will go. But thanks for the question. Got the first question. Uh, you mentioned embodied carbon should be a focus going forward. What are some of the promising directions that you can think of for addressing embodied carbon in data centers? Um, well, one of, one of them is just to get the data out. Uh, there's pretty good data on uh, servers and laptops, in part because they're kind of similar. But boy, it's very hard to find data on servers. Uh, in, in, and they vary by a lot from, you know, one metric ton per server to four metric tons. So that we just don't know what the data is. That, that'll be hard for uh, universities to do, but I would hope the companies will start figuring that out. Um, uh, how can you, uh, basically a way to, uh, reduce embodied carbon is to make your servers last longer, right? Or to basically need to buy fewer servers, basically. So making your servers last longer, uh, running them at higher efficiency, you know, and servers are often idle, you know, so trying to get more work out of the servers that you have, which, you know, saves money also will reduce how many servers we have to buy in, uh, help with carbon emissions. Thank you. So what makes us believe that if we drive the, the energy cost or the carbon cost of ML down, that, that the applications won't just you know, zoom in to, to consume that additional cost? I mean, that was the story of, of reduced energy costs for, you know, for decades as, as we drove uh, to better process nodes, we got more compute for the dollar, so we found applications, and that was the that's how we got this virtuous cycle. So, if we drive down the cost of uh, of 
ML training and inference, aren't we just going to consume that with the applications? I mean, won't the applications come to consume it? Yeah, that, this, this, this is called Jevons paradox is the economic one. It's a theory like that. And I can tell you, so what I think people don't appreciate, I think they just lose sight of the big picture, basically. So Google uses more energy every year for those three years, 2019, 2021. But Google does a lot of stuff besides email. You know, YouTube, we, uh, I, I don't think we've promised to keep everybody's video forever, but it feels like it. So there's a lot of stuff going on at Google besides ML. And so I think ML gets picked on because it's, you know, exciting and sexy and stuff like that. And, you know, and we're, we definitely are uh, building bare machines, but, you know, there is, a, you know, there's a limited amount of money that gets spent for hardware. And if we're, if we're spending a lot more on ML, we may well be spending a lot less on other things. That was what the story for the data centers. There were projections that, you know, data centers were gonna, you know, uh, eat the world in terms of global carbon mining because you know, especially the cloud was. But the, what happened is when people look is the cloud use of data centers, um, the net over like eight years, it went up like 5% and the reason, and which is much less than predictions. And the reason was because the clouds are so much more efficient than people having their own local data centers there. So the Jevons paradox thing gets brought up all the time. So that was why we wanted to see over, over time. And so ML is going up, but a lot of other things are going up as well. The other thing long term is if we decarbonize the grid, which uh, is hopeful. One of the most exciting things I've heard about is done, was done by Microsoft. They, they have given money to a startup company with the promise of a delivery in five years of a fusion reactor for their data center, which sounds like science fiction. I mean, five years, but you know they've signed a contract and this company is going to deliver. If we get fusion reactors for data centers, you know, that's that's going to be um, so anyways. So there's reasons to be hopeful about the operational pieces of it. Uh, embodied carbon, the reason why that won't go away is for semiconductor chips, only about half of it is the energy, half of the carbon emissions. And also, uh, you know, they're in Asia, so they don't have a lot of renewable energy. So pro my guess is uh, the big problem facing us is the embodied for information technology. I think the big problem is uh, the embodied. So I'm hoping more people work on that. In fact, when I put these slides, to, you know, I put these slides together, it, you know, when I kind of figured out this, you know, this, this ratio of embodied versus operational, it's, it's very large. If I look for 2021, it's maybe 100 to one, how much we spent on embodied versus how much uh, for ML. It's like, why did I work on this? <laughs> Oh, I'm not working on the right problem. And then I realized, I think, sorry, well, all the story was, oh, yeah, these people wrote these papers and they said it was gigantic. And if it was 100,000 times bigger, that'd be the problem to work on. But that, I think I've got the right data. So we got to get the data right. So that means we should work on something else. And this, I think the embodied is, the, is what I think would be. I'm pretty sure that's a problem that's not just, uh, you know, overinflated. Thanks. Um. First off, great talk, thank you. Um, do you have any opinions on the usage of reconfigurable hardware or the role that you see it playing in the future as far as reducing yeah. carbon emissions? Yeah, uh, one of the things when you talk to somebody who's been in the field as long as I, they're very opinionated. <laughs> I noticed that with my colleagues when I was younger and the senior faculty, wow, they, they really were sure cocksure that they had the right answer. So I'm kind of a reconfigurable skeptic. Um, I, I think reconfigurable has a role if uh, you're doing something that doesn't have high volume because reconfigurable costs in terms of energy and, uh, and, and dollars and die area. So it, if you've got something that but once, because once you have enough volume, like certainly machine learning has, that it's worth doing a custom chip. There's big factors of advantage. Certainly, factors of ten, maybe maybe, maybe more in there. So, I th th there was this kind of theory early on in the on the in this ML space that well, since ML models are changing fast, then FPGAs are flexible enough that they'll be a really great match. So you know, it just didn't turn out to be true. I mean, there there's you know. Microsoft and others really pushed on the FPGAs, but we never saw we never saw benchmarks run where they they blew out uh, they blew out the other ones. Kind of that's what we do in computer architecture. We come up with these theories, we convince companies to invest in them, 
and we do these billion dollar experiments where people bring out products and see how they work. Uh, and I just think you would say that the, uh, you know, the custom chips, you know, you, you, they weren't, you know, exactly a model. They didn't do exactly, you know, uh, LLSTMs. They're flexible, they're software there, but they're more dedicated. Chips seem to have won the, won the way. And, you, you know, looking at the evaluation of NVIDIA, uh, is what's happened to them as a company over the last 10 years, there's other indications of where the, at least the, financial people think where the future looks like. Uh, yeah, thanks for the great talk. Uh, this will be a bit of a follow-on to the question from just now uh, about uh, acceleration, because correct me if I'm wrong, the main takeaway that I take from this slide here is that the pie stayed the same size because people are feverishly working on the next generation of TPU that will make it so that the energy efficiency is better off them. So I was wondering, you kind of glossed over the next step for the TPUs, if, if you agree. Um, in the beginning of the well, talk, I think the, 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 you know, the pie gets bigger, but the slice stays the same size. Uh, Google does a lot of, I don't know that hardware is a significant fraction of our energy. Hardware development is probably not a significant fraction of our energy use. And, you know, this doesn't include the manufacturer chips, which is done by companies like TSMC. Great. But go ahead. Uh, so I was just wondering if you could expand a little bit on uh, the next step for hardware acceleration on the TPU side. You mentioned memory is the big problem. Um, I was wondering if you maybe could elaborate on that. And maybe there are further things that are on your mind as to what should come after that. I'd be very curious to hear. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would always ask people from the industry that question. Now that I'm in industry, I have learned that, uh, what, and, and you know, as a faculty member, you just say what you guarantee what the world's going to look like for the next five or 10 years. When you're in industry, you're not supposed to reveal product announcements as part of the talk. <laughs> uh, well, what we have talked about, uh, but, but, you know, memory is a big challenge for sure. I, I think everybody uh, agrees on that. What, what our secret plans are to do about that, I, I can't reveal. Uh, but uh, other company, uh, a bunch of companies are working on that issue. One very interesting thing that happened in TPU v4 is was the use of optical uh, circuit switching. Uh, so the interconnect, there's kind of racks of equipment that uses electronics, but the racks themselves are connected together with optical circuit switching. So you set up a path and then, you know, these MEMS mirrors uh, direct the data there. So that's very efficient in both energy and it, it provides very interesting uh, failure isolation. So I think uh, one of the interesting, you know, I think Google is probably a leader in uh, using optical technology in its data centers. But I would, and there's many people excited about replacing electrical communication with optical communication, even uh, going as far as optical communication on a chip. So I think that'll be a really interesting thing to see. You know, Norm Jupy, who does these designs, he's hard nosed. He says, if it, you know, if it doesn't, really work if TSMC is shipping it, we're not going to do experiments, but there's certainly, you know, what role will optical interconnect play in, uh, in computers of the future, uh, you know, AI accelerators of the future, I think it's a really interesting, be very interesting to watch. Uh, so uh, I'm uh, Radhika, I'm uh, listening in virtually, I'm from VMware Research. Um, I think uh, whenever I listen to talks about uh, sustainability, uh, one of the questions uh, that I have is that there has been energy efficient information processing in all life forms on earth. And I think uh, for me, the way I see it, uh, I see that uh, what's happening in biology is somehow um, life farms have figured out what kinds of information processing is needed uh, 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 for sustaining life um, and uh, maybe learning is fundamental. And then somehow life farms have figured out how to do it in the most energy efficient way. Um, and I feel like uh, computer sci as computer scientists, we are following the same pattern, except that we're trying to figure out how to do it in the most energy efficient way. And that's where your 4M, uh, the 4Ms uh, would fit in. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, uh, you know, you have uh, been uh, thinking of uh, personally or within Google, um, 
I'm curious, uh, what kinds of information processing are actually needed to sustain life and culture? Um, uh, so I, I was just curious about your thoughts. Yes, uh, you know, nature doesn't do this efficiently, right? Na nature uses evolution and time uh, to, to do these optimizations. Um, I, I think it makes sense for <laughs> to do something on a faster scale, so not, evo you know, to do experiments to try and find, explore the space to doing that. People are definitely using machine learning to explore the space to try and find more energy efficient locations. Um, you know, I think the other thing to keep in mind as an industry is, you know, we should be doing our share to reduce our carbon footprint, but there's a lot of industries that are, um, you know, much, much more significant. One of those is the airline industry. And now that I've been uh, exploring this space, I've learned how bad the airline industry is. So I try to not to travel places. I give talks virtually to try and avoid that. One of the upsides of AI is it can help. Uh, so I think one of the exciting things, examples of this is Google uh, looked at contrails and contrails, the, you know, the white things that come out of the back of jets when they're flying that's about one third of the footprint is due to uh, contrails. And now the con why is that? Because the contrails, uh, they act like clouds and they hold energy uh, on the planet. So Google did this experiment using AI to advise pilots how to avoid humid areas where contrails are formed. And they were able to cut contrails by half and it only increased the energy, uh, the fuel costs by less than a half percent. So that one AI example of uh, doing the contrails is very significant because it, uh, air transport is very significant compared to all of the uh, carbon emissions from ML. So I, th I think for us, it'll be more uh, directed rather than the way nature does it evolutionary, but you know, we can use nature as a shiny example. The human brain is only 20 watts or so, right? So. We can do tremendously better than where we are, but I think we're, we'll get there in a more direct path. So I think I've used up my time. <laughs> I'm, I'm using somebody else's time. So I think I should pass the baton probably. <laughs>